Welcome to Jumpstart Your Joy. I'm your host, Paula Jenkins. I invite you to join me as we explore how inspiring people have chosen joy in their lives and what they have to share with us about how to jumpstart joy in the world. Plus, how do we follow our own hearts, find work that lights us up while mindfully noticing the role joy plays in our own journey. Welcome to episode 140. This is Paula Jenkins, the host of Jumpstart Your Joy. Welcome to the show. This week, I'm doing a solo cast, and it's all about the four pillars of joy, which are inspiration, action, mindfulness, and play or fun. And I can't wait to go through each of them with you. I also (laughs) am digging into my love of religious studies, and I'm talking about Moses and how we can find the pieces of joy in his story. You guys, I had a lot of fun pulling this episode together. Before we get to that, I want to say happy June. I cannot believe we are all ready to June. The summer is here. I hope you're taking a few minutes to slow down and soak it up because I know I feel like May went so quickly. And I've heard a lot of other people say something quite similar. If you're new to Jumpstart Your Joy, thank you for joining. And if you want to find out more about the show, the website is jumpstartyourjoy.com. I'm Paula and I am the host. We have been in production since September of 2015. And so there's another 139 episodes just waiting for you back over at the website or It's always great to be a subscriber, so you can find Jumpstart Your Joy on iTunes, Spotify, Player FM, Google Play Music, all of the regular podcasting spots. Uh, And if you subscribe, you get episodes magically downloaded to your mobile device every week so you don't miss a thing. And leave a comment. Please leave a comment. It's so great to hear from you guys. And I want to give a very special shout out and a thank you to Knit Girl who left a five-star review on iTunes. Thank you. She says, love every episode. I love Jumpstart Your Joy. Every episode is inspiring and a breath of fresh air. There is always one or two things that truly resonate with me. I find myself jotting down a quote or note from nearly every episode. And thank you, Nick Girl. That just makes me so happy. I'm so glad you are listening. Please leave a note. I would love to hear from you guys. Um, Also, this episode is brought to you by my podcasting fundamentals class. If you are considering starting your own show, I would love for you to check out my guide. I give you guys my top suggestions for hardware and software, which are questions that I get all the time from people. So you can get that cheat sheet easily if you subscribe to the course, along with some of the mindset things that come up. Um, when you start a show, it's kind of vulnerable to put yourself out there. How do you go about that? So that's what the class is about. Go to the site, jumpstartyourjoy.com. From the top, there's a classes navigation and you can subscribe right there. Also super exciting. Starting in August, we will be kicking off Jumpstart Your Podcast. Yes, it's your chance to sign up for the class. So get on the list get on the email list, and you will be one of the few that finds out early about that class. So let's jump into this four tenets of joy. I'm really excited about this one. I feel like it was a lot of fun to pull together because as you guys know, joy has been the focus of this show for nearly four years, which is a really long time to spend with a topic. And you've probably heard me say that it feels a bit like a muse, like There's things about joy that draw me out, kind of like, you know, it it, um, delights me some days and some days it's really hard to feel joyful when there's so many hard things going on in the world. Um, The first episode of season three was all about that. Like, how do you find joy when things just seem like they're upside down? And I also love having had the last, I don't know, three or four months of episodes. There's been a lot of key moments where Joy has started to show me some of some deeper sides of itself. And it's really brought to life four aspects of joy that resonate with me highly and that I, I see that I'm starting to like do more with each of those four areas. So this week, we'll take a look at that quote that was definitely an inspiration when I started out. 
And, um, but then I also want to dig deeper around how to find more joy, because I understand that the fact is that joy is choice and that it can be lived out in multiple ways. But then how it, how that happens, I really want to talk about the four things, which are inspiration, mindfulness, action, and play. So let's start with joy is a choice. If you've been listening for a while, you know that I see joy as a wayfinding emotion. And one of the key quotes by Henry Nouwen, who was a professor at Yale Divinity School, he wasn't there when I was there, but to paraphrase his quote, it is, joy is a choice and we must keep choosing it every day. I've seen joy dance with people and reach out for people even when they're sometimes at their darkest times or their most difficult times. And I found, even in my own journey, that joy can look like a teeny inkling of hope or it could look like a little nudge to call a friend when you feel like you're just stuck in something or maybe make a, you know, make a call to a doctor because you're not feeling well and you get a sense that you need to try and feel better. And and it joy looks like that second in your life, like several guests have said. I know em- Emily Ann Peterson talks about it. I know I talk about it. And I've had a lot of clients talk about it. It's that moment when you know that there is something more to your life than whatever your current crappy circumstance is. And I don't mean that lightly <laughs> or in a joking way. It could be that you're having a health issue or just you're, you're feeling a depression or whatever circumstance you're feeling in, I feel like joy often comes in the tiniest of ways and it often starts in this place that you know that you want more, you desire more, and that you're personally meant more, for more than what you are experiencing right now. And that doesn't downplay the circumstance or your situation in any way. That's a reality and you're the way that you choose to react to it is your choice. And that's one of, from one of my favorite books, The Last Lecture by Randy Pausch. His quote there is, we can't change the cards we're dealt, but we can decide how we play the hand. And that's another way of seeing that same thing. You may have been dealt a really crappy hand, but you get to decide how it plays out or how you play it out. So that's, that's where the quote about joy is a choice begins. It begins when joy reaches out for you, which is something you'll also hear Debbie Augenthaler and I talk about next week. She's um, a psychotherapist and she wrote a great book about You Are Not Alone. It's when joy breaks through the crap or the difficulty or the hard time and it finds you. And sometimes that's totally unexpected. You know, it's that moment in hard times when you feel something happy or you knew, you maybe notice that a food tastes good or you feel yourself smile and maybe you were kind of not expecting to spot, smile on that in that moment because maybe something really awful had happened. And I want to debunk two myths that bubble up from time to time around joy and this work when we start talking about reconnecting with our own joy. And these are things that both totally surprised me. And so I think they're worth talking about. Um, cause I want us to embrace that we are truly non binary beings in an emotional sense. And what do I mean by that? I mean, emotionally, things are not always good or not always bad, right? Like if you go back and listen to the confidence episode with Julie and Liz, We talk about maybe how the inner critic often wants us to think of things as being binary, black or white, good, bad, awful, wonderful. And that's not the truth of our experience most of the time. The truth of the experience is that you can feel more than one emotion at once, and that is kind of surprising. So it could be that you're in the midst of a really difficult time, you're in the midst of depression, maybe you're mourning the loss of someone, and at the same time of of feeling those kinds of hard emotions, you can also feel joy or happiness or delight even when you're feeling overwhelmed by another, and I'll call them negative, but they're just a fact of being, another kind of emotion, right? There's space and capacity for you to feel both. And if you want to listen more about that, I really encourage you to go back to the Julia Samuel episode, and I'll link up to all of this in the show notes. And I feel like the big takeaway is we need to feel both, right? We need to have joy in the midst of sorrow or bereavement because it reminds us of who we are. It reminds us that there is something else. And it makes the difficult time bearable. 
So that's, that's myth one that there's no way you could have two emotions, emotions at once. So it's not okay. And I feel like often myself or clients, other people judge themselves when they're feeling more than one emotion, especially when they're strong emotions at the same time. You could be in mourning and still be delighted and laugh out loud at a movie, right? Like it just can happen. And I want you to be okay with that. The other thing that stands out for me, I would say I'm naturally wired to be a fairly joyful and happy person. And one of the things that I have seen is that oftentimes society very much wants us to be not too much of something. And there is a, there's some sort of unwritten rule somewhere that if you are a happy person, then maybe you're not also serious. That if you're goofy or joyful or silly, then, then you're not also smart or you're not taking things seriously enough. And I really want to debunk that because you can be a super smart person. You can be, you can be totally business minded. You can be an Ivy League graduate and you can still be somebody that's laughing and having a great time at work and being silly and goofy, right? Like I want to debunk that again. We're not just binary. We're not smart. Or funny. You could be smart and funny. And I think that brings such a beautiful breadth to our experience in our own life if we're okay and we can embrace both of those sides of our own self. Because I really wanted to bring those two up before we get into these four tenants and Moses. (laughs) Just because I don't want any of us to hide our joy because of other people's non-dual thinking. I don't want you to hide your joy in this world just because other people are uncomfortable with it. That's not why we're here. What if instead of hiding your joy or being like afraid that you're too much in any way, what if instead of you being too much in any way, the issue is just with other people? that they are uncomfortable with happiness, that maybe they're uncomfortable with extreme emotions in any way, that somehow as a child they were told that they were too much and so now they take that on to mean anybody is too much. What if it's their issue instead of yours that you're happy? Because I think that's actually how it works, right? It's their issue and most certainly it should not be something that makes you dim your own enjoyment of your life or change how you live. Because I think we all get caught up in these judgments. They could either be self judgments or they could be assumptions of what other people are thinking of us. And I want you to own your joy. Own it. (laughs) That's why you're here. So let's look at these four pillars. I'm going to start though, because I, I, I don't know how much I've even shared about this on the podcast, but so my background and my path has been, I was a religious studies major at UCSB. And I loved the ancient Near East, which is the history and stories of the tribes before the Old Testament. And then I went on to Yale Divinity School and got my master's there in religion, primarily in Old Testament. And so I took Hebrew for (laughs) biblical Hebrew for four years. When I was thinking about this show, I don't know why, but Moses came up. You guys probably all know Moses in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus and how he was first called by God to be a leader of the Hebrew people. And you probably know the story of the burning bush. And then Moses goes on to, he's leading the Israelites out of Egypt. And he later is the gentleman that gets the Ten Commandments from God on Mount Sinai. And so let's look at his story for just a minute, maybe with some new eyes here. So the burning bush, right? This was the first way that God got Moses' attention. So Moses was a shepherd. He was out minding his sheep and noticed, as if you were standing next to a bush that caught on fire, he noticed that there was a burning bush next to him. And from that bush, God called to him and said, hey, Moses, I want you to go out and lead the Israelites out of Egypt, where they were being enslaved by the Pharaoh. And so let's pause here for a minute, because what do you think Moses did? God had just spoken to him from a bush. And, you know, this is like the moment of inspiration, if you will. He's not yet truly face-to-face with divinity, but he is right there in the presence of God. And so what do you think he does? Well, he <laughs> he did exactly what I would do, I think, when inspiration that is that profound strikes. He, he asked questions. <laughs> he did not jump up, get excited, or get right to it. He asked why the people, so the Israelites, would believe him. And he also asked a question that I think a lot of us ask when we realize we're being struck by inspiration, which is, who am I to go 
to Pharaoh and lead the people out of Israel. Who am I to do this? Like, who do you think I am? Why are you asking me to do this? And his purpose there had been presented in this very literal blaze on the side of a mountain, like, hey, you're going to be the leader of these people. But he's asking first, like, why me? And then he says, well, who do I say that I am? Like, you're telling me to go do this, but what if they don't believe me? Who should I even say I, I am? So he keeps fighting this call that has been put out in front of him and this direction and this inspiration for the purpose of his life. And I see myself doing that all the time. I bet you guys do it all the time. I see clients fighting the inspiration that's right in front of them as bright as a blazing burning bush. It's the inspiration that might take them to their own joy. And of course, God tells him after he's (laughs) asked, who do I say sent me? He said, well, tell them I sent you. And then Moses asks a few more questions. And God tells them, well, you can throw your staff on the ground and it's going to turn into a snake. And then, of course, people will know that you're Moses and I told you to go, you know, and I sent you. Moses, very simply put, is not having any of it. He gives God two more questions to prove to him that he's supposed to lead. And one of them is he can turn his hand different colors when he removes it from his cloak. And God tells him to put water on the ground and it will turn into blood. So there's all these proof points, right? Like, no, you're really the one that's supposed to go do this thing. And then Moses still isn't having it, so he reasons with God. He says, I'm not eloquent. He says, I'm slow of speech and tongue. And the last ditch effort, this is the fifth thing that he does to try and wiggle his way out of being the chosen person here, is he says, God, please send someone else. And then he says, he's, you know, he's begging at this point, probably because he just doesn't want to have to do this thing. And of course, Moses' journey continues, like I said earlier, that he becomes the person that in fact does lead the people out of Egypt. He parts the Red Sea on the way. He follows his purpose. He leads the people then for 40 years in the wilderness and then goes on to receive the Ten Commandments from the top of Mount Sinai. So the Moses that we see early on in the book of Exodus, that's Exodus 2 where the story starts, is so very different than the Moses that we see in Exodus 31 when he receives the Ten Commandments. And there's this other, one other joyful nugget in the middle of this story. It's Exodus 15, 21. And then we'll get to the four pillars, I promise. But this is the oldest part of the entire Bible, and it's known as the Song of Miriam. Miriam is Moses' sister. And this really ancient text comes right as the people are being led out of um, Egypt, and the, they've made it out, and she begins to sing. She picks up a tambourine and dances with the other women, and her song of praise says, Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, both horse and driver he has hurled into the sea. And you know, when I read that, it's so striking to me that that nugget, the oldest, literally the oldest piece of the entire Bible, is a song of praise and joy. It's a song of praise and joy. And I just love that. And that it's women singing. I love it. There's so much there. We could, that's an entire podcast episode. So what does this have to do with joy in the four pillars? Well, Moses' journey of leading the people out of slavery and to the land of milk and honey is like your or our own path to joy. It's a metaphorical example, at least here, in finding and following joy. So let's break it down. Moses first heeds the call of inspiration, even though, even though he's doing it totally begrudgingly. And I see so much of everybody's, you know, reaction to like, oh my gosh, I have to do that. You know, like, I don't know that inspiration and the places that joy calls you are always the easiest or the ones you would choose for yourself. So we see that there with Moses. He also had a shift in his mindset. He, you know, he was going to have to go from kind of begrudgingly being this person that was going to do this to then stepping up to being the leader, right? There's coaching in there. There's a shift probably from everything he knew as a shepherd and leadership. And so that's the second piece that we're going to look at too. And then he takes action on that purpose, right? There, it's not that he just sits back and goes, wouldn't it be joyful? No, he, he leads people. He, he parts the Red Sea. They wander for 40 years. There's a lot of action in getting to the joy of the promised land. And then for fun and play, both Moses and Miriam celebrate their freedom by dancing and singing a song of praise when they followed their inspiration. 
So inspiration, let's start with the first of these four pillars. I hope you've appreciated the story of Moses because I obviously love it myself. But in my my own experience, inspiration is the tip of the iceberg for joy. You may have an experience of inspiration in many different ways. Kind of like, you know, inspiration may be very obvious and show up in your life like a burning bush. Or it might be something a lot more subtle than that. You know, I believe that moments of inspiration or taking notice of the things that inspire you, well, those are inklings of joy. In my journey, the inspiration came in way of spiritu- in the way of spirituality. Kind of, I got drawn into that world. I got drawn into the world of religion and religious studies. And this goes a little bit meta, I guess. But part of the inspiration was seeing the stories of people and how they have risen to the challenge of of their own path and what's being asked of them. And there's a ton of inspiration for me in there. And it kind of, following the thread of religion, it took me from a place of a fairly standard high school education into this much deeper place just at UC Santa Barbara, and then even further into the study of kind of psychology and why are people interested in following their own path and figuring out what brings them joy? Like, I didn't know that's exactly what I was studying when I studied it, but that's where that inspiration took me. It was leading me all through that path and then later to get certified as a life coach and then later to to start the show. So I think inspiration is that way-finding emotion. It's helping me weave the path. And when I find myself a little bit off the path, I can always go back to the question of, okay, where was I inspired? What's inspiring me now? I also love what Wayne Dyer says, um, and that was an early part of my inspired journey as well. He talks about inspiration being in spirit or inspired, right? Like you're getting close to divinity when you feel that surge of inspiration. So I, I think it's super important when you find the things that you get a little bit excited about or a little bit curious about. Inspiration can feel different for each of us, but when you start to feel it, to go follow it. Maybe, I don't even remember where the suggestion came in, but like when you start to feel like, okay, this person or this person's writing, like, these things seem inspirational to me and I'm really curious about it, like then surround yourself with that person's writing. Read everything they wrote. Really soak it up because you're going to find that little nugget that then will take you on to the next thing if that isn't your final resting pl- you know, point with your purpose. And if you want to find out more about that one, The Power of Intention is a really great book where Wayne Dyer talks about that and getting in touch with inspiration. The next thing along the lines, and I think looking at the story of Moses and how it progressed, is so he has the initial piece of inspiration, and then it goes into a mindset and mindfulness game. I have a lot of guests on the show that are coaches, and it's because I'm a, I mean, I'm a certified coach, and I know a lot of people in the field, and psychology is super interesting to me. There's a couple of things that come up when you start to follow inspiration, And some of it is around this mindfulness. There's two steps that I see, and then we can talk about where Moses probably fell into these two things. The first step is setting your sights on something. So I like talking about the mindfulness of joy because while you are likely experiencing joy from day to day, right? I think I've read that, what, 15% of your day is probably a positive experience, 15% might be negative-ish, and then 70% of a normal person's day has that mid-range of it's just sustaining. And I believe that that comes from Alice Domar, and she's a a psychologist uh, out of Boston. The essence of jumpstarting your joy, if you're not already in the headspace of being joyful, you know, and maintaining a happy or joyful space, is that you mindfully choose it. And that's why I call joy a wayfinding emotion. If you aim for joy or happiness, even if that's not what your current situation is, then you're going to be directing yourself towards it, right? Like choices that you make, if you're mindfully choosing joy, choices that you make are then going to lead you to further joy. You decide once you've decided to see things in a joyful way, then you start to see the good in other things in your day to day. You will still recognize in this space when you're starting out on jumpstarting your joy, you will still recognize when things are not how you'd like, right? Like there's still going to be days where you're like, "Ah, nothing's working, right? I even still have these days where everything feels hard or 
something sticks out and maybe someone wasn't nice to me. Those moments and days are still there, but then I choose, back to that Randy Pausch thing, I choose how I react to the difficult situation. And I can mindfully choose joy again and again and focus on the better parts of my day instead of the awful parts of my day. (laughs) And some of the guests on the show, when I ask about, you know, what are three ways you can jumpstart your joy at the end of each show, they talk about mindful ways that then then they've been able to jumpstart joy in their life. So there's some really nice mindfulness shifts, even if it's a gratitude list, recalling what you loved as a child. Like those are things that you could do as a mindfulness thing, right? Like I'm grat- I'm I'm grateful for these things in my day, or I remember that I loved playing with animals, so maybe I will mindfully make a choice to go play with some animals. And then we're getting into some action territory, but I'm trying to stick here with that the psychological and the mind piece of it. Another thing that you can try is the thing that I talk about when you're, you catch yourself in the moment of making a decision and reflect very quickly. It doesn't have to be, you know, a five minute thing that you take out of your day, but really quickly reflect on is this thing based on love or fear before you take the action or make the decision? If you can say wholeheartedly, I mean, you can even, I'm putting my hand on my heart now, (laughs) almost subconsciously. If you say, yeah, that's coming from my heart. I really love the feeling that I get if I'm going to do that. Or I love what that's going to do for me. Or I love what that's going to do for other people if I make that decision. Yes, that's going towards joy, right? That is a mindful decision. If you're like, I don't know. I think I'm just going to do that because I'm worried about what someone will think if I'm not there. Or I'm just going to do that because I already told them I'd go and now I don't know how to get out of this thing. Well, those, you're making that decision based in fear. And when you catch yourself, then it's time, the action that comes out of that, which is, of course, our next step, the action is to then (laughs) respectfully bow out. You don't want to be there. Just, it's okay to be that person. It's okay to live by your word and be in integrity and say, no, thank you. So if we go a bit deeper in dealing with mindset, you can go pretty far on your own, right? Like I think those are little tools where you can start to catch yourself and be mindful. The thing with mindfulness is it often takes a little bit of deeper work and the ability to catch yourself when you're making decisions and figure out where you're coming at from things can be hard. And sometimes you need more than just a simple jump start to get there. So I think that there's a lot to do here with society and upbringing, and it doesn't always teach awareness, especially if I imagine that most of the audience probably understands about self-awareness, that you you can understand what your what impact your actions have on other people, that you're aware that you're part of a bigger ecosystem here on the planet, that emotionally, um, that you also have the ability to make your own choices on what you do. You know, you don't have to do things based on other people's shoulds. Those are all things that weigh into self-awareness. And so I like talking to coaches about mindfulness because as a group, we've spent a lot of time on the topic. Sometimes in order to get a bigger sense of joy in your life, you need to shed a little bit of the past or you maybe need to spend time with someone who can help you turn something over in a new way and look at situations or um, specific scenarios with just a different angle. If your family of origin is a naturally a more of a negative group of people or you come up from an upbringing where the predominant mindset was something along the lines of good things only happen to other people or if you were brought up equating goodness or happiness as something reliant on an external factor, you might have a harder time accepting and getting to a place where you truly believe you are good, you are inherently good, which is, I think, a truth for all of us, and that you inherently also have a right as a human to experience joy and be happy. So if those things feel like a hard space, that might be a really great place for you to see about working with someone else could be a friend, it could be a family member, it could be that you're reading a lot of books and getting a lot of input from a book. But that is part of why I like bringing coaches on the show is to talk about joy and how we find joy and how people can get unstuck from difficult situations because I think there's a lot there. And that's why I love talking to coaches and I think why I love spending a lot of time in that space. So if you feel like you are questioning your if you're worthy of joy or if you wish you could get into the headspace of of being able to process joy, 
in a bigger way, you can drop me a note at jumpstartyourjoy at gmail.com. Or if you want to explore that topic on your own, I love Andrea Owen's book, How to Stop Feeling Like Shit. I think it dives right in around that topic. And I'll link up to that in the show notes. She's also in a previous episode. You'll find that link in the show notes too. And if you want to break through the the amount of negativity in your life, Byron Katie, oh my gosh, I know you guys probably remember that I am a huge fan of her work. And she has a book called A Thousand Names of Joy, Living in Harmony with the Way Things Are. Highly recommend it. It is amazing. So one note I want to be careful on as we get, as we move in from mindfulness into action, because I feel this also deserves kind of like a little footnote, the essence of moving towards joy and making that mindful choice to follow joy is not, I want to be super clear, not to force fit feeling happy all of the time. That's not what this is about. It's also not about just repeating positive affirmations because then things will shift and get better. I don't believe that that is true. I think in a larger sense, <laughs> the law of attraction, yes, a positive mindset helps. But that said, I don't believe that you should ignore your feelings or um, any of your feelings of dis- discomfort or stress. And you shouldn't just push away the difficult things or the, the uncomfortable thoughts if you have them. I do believe that you should dive in, you should get curious, and you should work on shifting how you think and experience things. And some of that could come with working from a coach. You can do work on your own. And I think the closer you get to being able to choose joy and actively be close to joy, then you start to build that as a muscle. But I just, I feel like it's worth underlining the fact that this is not a thing where I'm saying you should ignore the things that are hard about your life. I definitely think you should work through them because on the other side, the joy is even bigger once you've worked through trauma or depression or hard things. I I swear I've been there and the joy on the other side is so amazing and vast. So if you're feeling in a hard space, please seek help. The fourth tenant is action. And this is the part that feels a little bit shiny and new to me and I don't really know why. I mean, I think from a professional space, I love action as a thing. Um, I'm a project manager. I love building. I love creating. I love seeing what if and what comes of things when we start to take steps. Big believer in baby steps. So I think this action piece and the inherent action of the joy quote, joy is a choice and we must keep on choosing it. The action in there is kind of hard to see. And choosing, of course, is an action. And beyond that, what I've started to realize, especially by some of my very, some of the guests that have left the most impact on me most recently, Fred LeBlanc of the band Cowboy Mouth. You need to go back and listen to that if you haven't been tuning in for him. So amazing. And then Suzanne Colon talks about the yoga mind, and there's a lot of action in that as well. So I would say go listen to those two. But Beyond the just the choosing of joy, there's also an inherent action that comes out that you're going to need to take the action to live out whatever your choice is. So joy is a series of choices that then ultimately leads to action. So if we look back at Moses, his series of choices then led to his action of being a leader. And I realized I didn't talk about the mindful piece, mindfulness piece, but I think He probably had a lot of mindfulness change and shift when they were wandering in the desert for 40 years because a lot of people were complaining and a lot of people were hungry and he had to mindfully get into a space where he could continue to follow the joy, the inspiration to get the people to the promised land. I think there was probably a huge mindset shift that probably took place in 40 years in the Bible when they talk about anything at 40 that has a 40 in front of it, it usually just means a long time, right? Like longer than usual. (laughs) So we don't know if it was really 40 years or not. But back to action. It really is a series of choices that often leads to a physical action. The the choices start as that mindset choice, right? Well, it's it starts as the inspiration, really. You can choose to see the inspiration or you can choose to walk past it as just another part of your day. Then you can choose to 
to make joy the mindset choice that you're making, right? That's a choice within a choice. And then, and then it moves into something that you do. And as I was writing that out, it reminded me of this great song, which I'll also link up. So many links this time, right? Um, but the song by Clint Black about love and it's, and it, the lyrics are, it's some, love is not something that we have. It's something that we do. And he actually, in an interview, very interestingly said that he was inspired by Stephen Covey's Seven Habits Habits of Highly Effective People when he wrote that, which is so interesting. But the idea there being that joy is an action and an, and an emotion, and it is not just a flat noun that is something that you have. And I, I'm inspired by that song every time I hear it. So joy is not simply deciding to ignore everything and be happy. And it's something that you and I can both choose. Some people are naturally more inclined to be happy. And that doesn't mean that joy is out of reach for other people. We can all choose it. And by choosing it and acting on it, it becomes easier to choose it and act on it the next time and the time after that. If you treat joy as a habit, similar to the way that Kate Swoboda talks about it in Making Courage a Habit, we'll link up to that in the show notes she was on recently, It becomes part of you, right? You build joy in as a habit. It becomes part of you. You build it in by choosing it and you make it a part of your routine by making and taking direct action to make joy a reality in your world. And it becomes part of your day. And I will highlight this too. I know that it can feel hard the first few times you try something. And I want you to remember that the first, there's only ever going to be one first time for something, right? The first time you record a podcast is the only first time you'll ever have to do it. And then it gets easier. Then it gets so much easier. The last part is play for the sake of play. And I know um, calling it out as the song of Miriam and that it's the oldest part of the Bible. I think there's something so rich about this territory that whatever your religious beliefs are, that the core of this text, the oldest part of this text is a song of joy and delight and praise. I think that the message there could be made that we are supposed to do things that don't have a specific singing a song you could tell God you were praising them in a different way. But like part of our being longs to just make these things that are creation for creation's sake, that are joy for joy's sake, that are play for play's sake. And when you, I'll admit that it breaks down a little bit here because clearly there was an output in mind in Miriam singing to God, it was for praise. But I think when we can let go of the outcome, I'm going to go, you know, plant some things in my garden because I want to see beauty and joy. That's just play for play's sake. I'm going to, you know, take a few minutes and write a haiku. That's just play for play's sake. And when we can let go of the outcome, I think joy dances in the middle in there somewhere. It, It finds us in the creation and in our desire to take the action to do something that is just fun and rejuvenating and maybe beautiful and connecting. When when we do those things, joy comes and finds us, right? Like it doubles down. It reaches out for us in a new way because it's like, hey, I see what you're doing. Let's play. And so I really encourage you, if you have not taken the time recently, just, I mean, so Julia Cameron talks about this in the in the artist's way, make time, go out and do something for fun's sake, right? Summer's a great time to do this. Go explore something new. Go take yourself on a date, you know, for joy's sake. And I'll link up to Julia Cameron's book in the show notes as well. So there we are. I hope you guys had fun with this. I had a lot of fun putting it together. The four pillars are, of course, inspiration, uh, mindfulness, action, and then fun and play just for the fun of it. I hope that you guys have learned something here. I would love to hear if some of this touched you, if you liked hearing about Moses (laughs) as much as I like talking about him. I would love to connect because it's been a little while since I did a solo cast and I love doing them. So next week on the show, I'm super thrilled to have Debbie Augenthaler coming on. She's a psychotherapist that deals with loss, mourning, and grief. And she lost her own husband unexpectedly as a younger woman. 
and then realized that she had a huge capacity to help others um, that came out of 9-11, amazingly. And so I'm honored to have her on next week and would love it if you guys will come back for that. And of course, if you are thinking of starting your own podcast and would like a little suggestion, a list of suggestions on the hardware software to use, head to the website, jumpstartyourjoy.com, and you can get it there. And if you want show notes for this, you want to go back to the myriad of things that I've referenced here, you can find it at jumpstartyourjoy.com forward slash four joys. That's plural. Also on the homepage this week. Um, So I hope that you'll come back next week to hear from Debbie and I. And until then, I hope that your days are filled with so much joy.